Hey everyone, welcome to another screencast. Today I want to focus on aerobic decoupling with running power. So in this screencast, I want you to walk away from this with an idea of what is aerobic decoupling, how running with power changes this, factors influencing aerobic decoupling, traditional versus new ways to track aerobic decoupling, give you some concrete examples, and then implementation of this information into your workouts. So first off, let's focus on what aerobic decoupling is. Coupling is the parallel relationship between an input, like your heart rate, and an output, so power or speed. So if you look at your training peaks account and you see that nice pretty graph, you should see that your heart rate and power, especially if you're cycling, the heart rate and power should be parallel, and that means your heart rate and power are coupled. So a shift in this ratio, ratio meaning that they start to become unparallel lines, that is aerobic decoupling. So when tested at your aerobic threshold, 80 to 85% of your FTP, it can serve as a measure of heat tolerance, hydration, aerobic fitness, fatigue resistance, and even potentially glycogen stores. So if you go out for a ride or a run for an extended period of time at your aerobic threshold, over time, your heart rate will start to drift. Chances are it's going to rise or fall as you continue to keep that same power output, and th this is decoupling. Conversely, if you try to hold the same heart rate, your power is most likely going to fall over time to keep uh, as you accommodate to keep that heart rate steady. So if you want to check out the, the formula for this, it's the, and this is obviously can be calculated with w, uh, WKO, Training Peaks, or any of the uh, software out there, but it might be helpful to get familiar with how this is calculated. So let's say you go out for, you do an hour long test or you have an hour long segment. You're gonna take that first 30 minutes, your power average for the first 30 minutes, divide it by your heart rate average for the first 30 minutes. Subtract it by the power for the second 30 minutes over your heart rate for the second 30 minutes and divide all of that by your power and heart, over your heart rate for that first 30 minutes. And that will get you a percentage somewhere in between zero and I've seen it even go up to you know 20%. So typically it's in between those runs. You will get some negative numbers and we'll see that later, uh, which most likely is a influence of environmental factors like temperature and not warming up enough. But typically you will see numbers between 0% and 20%. So it factors affecting aerobic decoupling. First is hydration. Uh, if you're, when you are dehydrated, your blood volume drops and therefore your heart has to work harder to get the blood around your body. Altitude is another one because there's less oxygen in the air. To get more oxygen or the oxygen that is needed to your muscles, your heart has to work harder. Muscle fatigue. So as you're over the course of a hard workout or race, your major muscle fibers, your type one fibers, begin to break down over the course of that race. When this happens, smaller, less economical muscles, those are your type two, that usage increases to pick up the slack of the fatigue type one. Now, since these type two muscle fibers require about twice as much oxygen, your heart needs to pump more to keep the same power output. Now, um, um, Alan Cousins brings up the point that this could also be muscle fatigue, you know, muscle breakdown, but this fatigue also could be from glycogen stores being depleted. So over the course of that race or that workout, you are going to be burning glycogen. Now that varies from athlete to athlete, but over that course of the workout, you will be burning gly glycogen in different ratios. As you burn, as your muscle fibers lose that glycogen and burn that glycogen and don't have enough glycogen to rely on, that means they're fatiguing. So your type two muscles, once again, have to pick up the slack and that's going to require more oxygen so your heart rate goes up. So you could use aerobic decoupling as a sign of how much glycogen you have in your muscles. So traditionally versus new ways to track aerobic decoupling. Traditionally, it's been, especially in the run, heart rate to normalized pace. So if you go out on a hilly, a hilly run, 
training peaks will try to create a uh, you will plug all of how many feet you rose and how many feet you decline uh, descended and they will create a normalized pace for you now the problem with this is if you wanted to compare runs, it's hard to do that even with normalized pace because of the elevation gains and all that. So it's hard to compare your runs unless you're comparing runs done on flats, the same course, treadmills, or track. It's also hard to track in real time because you don't know your normalized pace. So if you wanted to test it traditionally, you would have to use a treadmill or a track or a very flat course. With a power meter, a running power meter though, you could do heart rate to normalize power. And the benefit of this is that A, power is more consistent and reliable than both pace and normalized pace. It's also easier to track in real time over different courses. So if you are a cyclist, you know how easy it is to track power versus speed when you're out on a ride. Same thing here. It's a lot easier to monitor and manipulate your power than trying to figure out and calculate your normalized pace or even your pace over the course of a run or workout. So how do you track this? So, or when do you track this more specifically? Typically this is done during the base period to track aerobic fitness. So if you're a brand new runner, typically a coach will look at your workout vials and see how coupled your heart rate and in this case power are, or your heart rate and pace are. It also is a good indicator that you might need a switch in intensity and switch from a base period to a build period. And coaches will monitor monitor the course of your progression and the more coupled you are over the course of a workout, the more aerobically fit you are. And therefore, if you become too aerobically fit, it might be time for a new stimulus. And then you'll switch over to the build phase and in which case you're focusing more on intensity and doing you're not only doing long, slow distances anymore or the majority of your runs are no longer long, slow distances. So in the build phase, it's actually helpful to track and make sure that your aerobic base hasn't eroded. So are you doing too many sprints? And if you do too many sprints or too many hill reps without getting those longer miles in, your aerobic base will suffer. So it's a good indicator to make sure that your aerobic base isn't eroding. And then of course, do, oh, excuse me, during your race or peak phase to test race pace readiness at specific powers. And this is another benefit of using a power meter on your run is that you're able to do these tests. So it's very good for longer events such as half marathons, marathons, ultra marathons, half Ironman events, full Ironman events, events that are going to be longer than one hour. When you get into the 5K and 10K events, it's less important because you don't need that strong aerobic base and need more muscular power and muscular endurance. So how can you test this? So a typical test will look like this. You'll go for a good one mile to 20 minute at a very low power zone, very easy. You'll do a few pickups, so you'll stride. I like to do football football diagonal, so striding across a football diagonal just to get my leg turnover and my body prime for, I wouldn't say a harder effort, but just at a higher, uh, higher pace. And then I go out for 60 to 120 minutes, depending on the event. So if I'm doing a half marathon, a 60 minute test or a 90 minute test would work. Uh, if I was focusing more on the marathon, I would do a 120 minute test. I've even read sources that if you're training for an ultra, you can do three hour tests of this. And typically the, these are your results. So if you're over 5%, you still need to improve your aerobic fitness, hydration, and fuel. So if you're over 5%, that means you are decoupling. Four to five percent is, according to Joe Friel, the sweet spot of coupling. You want a little bit of variation, but if you're in that four to five percent range, that means you are coupled and aerobically fit. Now, if you're between zero and three point nine percent, that might need you might need more intensity. You might need to restructure your phase that you're in to include more intensity so that you can focus more on building your FTP and being able to instead of holding your heart rate and power parallel. That means you're going to be, you're, you want to push up your power and how much power you can put while keeping that heart rate steady. And then also, if you will get some negative numbers, this might need you need to warm up better or influence of environment like weather and hills. So a good warm up for these tests is very important because obviously you're going to have aerobic decoupling in your warm up. You're going from walking to jogging, so your heart rate's going to be going from the low hundreds to you know 150 and above, obviously you're going to have aerobic decoupling then.
so it's important to get that good warm-up in. So let me give you an example of what this looks like in an actual training setting. So I did a long run uh, a couple weeks ago, and if you look at the, so this is, it was a, let's look at the data, two hour and almost 20 minutes, 19 miles, and if we look over here, this is where you're going to find the coupling. Now this screenshot is from the Training Peaks website, trainingpeaks.com, and you will see that over the course of the whole entire workout, my aerobic decoupling was under 5%. Now the problem with saying, oh, you know, you're fit, you're, oh, that's a good number, I should continue on training, is that includes the warm-up, where I'm obviously going to be decoupling, and then it also includes the cool-down when my power drops and I'm starting to cool down. Also in this workout, I did two miles at zone three. So I did a fast finish workout. So I did my warm up, I did 13 miles in zone two, and then I did two miles in zone three. All of that information, it goes into calculating that. So that number isn't necessarily a good indicator. You really have to dig into the data and look at the actual test that I did. So I'm gonna be focusing on, because I wanna focus on aerobic decoupling, 13 miles at my zone two. So I wanna focus on this segment right here. Now, if you go to the website versus looking at your iOS app, you will notice that the website covers 4.5, uh, covers pace to heart rate rather than power to heart rate. So you have to open up your iOS app on your either your iPhone or your iPad to look at your power to heart rate on a run decoupling. And here you will see that there's a slight difference. It goes to 4.06% for the entire workout when we look at the power to heart. So there's a little bit of variation there when you compare power to heart rate versus pace to heart rate. So let's actually look at the test. So here I zoomed in on the website. You can see that my heart rate and power are pretty much parallel lines. You can also see my minutes per mile that's in green there. It, it's all parallel. It seems perfectly stitched together. It's one almost straight line with a few variations because of hills. If we look at my power to heart rate, my aerobic decoupling, because of the parallel lines, my heart rate and pace didn't change. That's that. And my heart rate and power didn't change. They're all right around 0%. I was able to hold this 275 watts while maintaining about 155 beats per minute the whole entire 13 miles. So that's, that's good news. Um, that's a good indicator that I need to change up the stimulus. I need to move away from this build phase or this base phase into my build phase. So overall analysis, very little decoupling. It's negative most likely because of the environment. There are a few undulations, um, but I was able to hold a steady pace, power, and heart rate. They were all coupled together. The negative could also be because I had to stop and do a quick cell phone check to make sure I wasn't getting lost. That I think took about a minute overall. Um, so that did fudge the numbers just a tad, but a minute over that hour and a half of running doesn't make that much of a deal. Both pace and heart rate versus power for heart rate, both in line, but it's I found it easier to track with power during the actual test. Because of the undulations in the course that I chose and mapped out, it I my pace would go from you know 745 on the uphills to 645 on the downhills, and because of that, my heart rate was influenced. However, I was really focused on maintaining that 275, which is 80. 85% uh, of my FTP, I was focusing on keeping that 85% power number, and by focusing on that, it was a lot easier with the undulations in the course. I also need to work on hydration and fueling. If we snap back to here, where I did my fast finish, you will see that my power didn't really increase, but my heart rate started to go up a lot. And looking at that, I, in my opinion, that shows, A, I need to work on my faster finish. I need to become more fit in that sense. Um, and I need to work on my hydration and my fueling so that I'm able to have energy stores to draw upon in that fast segment. So another test for aerobic decoupling and fitness. Now that I'm moving from my build phase into my base phase and incorporating more intensity, that's going to be my primary focus in boosting my FDP, 
I want to make sure that my aerobic fitness as a whole isn't suffering because of that. So here's another test where you can do that. And this is, I modified this from a Joe Friel workout that I read about and I've started and have used in cycling but haven't done it with running and power. So this is what I'm going to be using going forward to test to make sure that my aerobic fitness is still in place even though I'm moving into my build phase. So it's 10 to 20 minute uh, warm up with pickups standard just like I said before that's very important and then 4 by 800 meters in zone 5 power with a cut down rest and the reason why I'm using power and not heart rate here is a because power is easier to track there's also less of a lag if you did this with heart rate you would notice that your heart rate took about 30 seconds to get up into that zone 5 level versus power where it's almost instantaneous and then for each rest, I'm going from 90 seconds to 75 seconds to 60 seconds in between these 4 by 800s. From there, I go into 10 to 20 minutes in a constant zone 3 power and see where my heart rate goes. Or I'm going to try to hold a zone 3 heart rate and track power. I like the first method uh, just because I feel like that's a better, more accurate version. But you can also do it reverse with focusing on heart rate and seeing where your power goes. It would be cool to compare the two, but I, I'm going to try to hold a steady power and then see what happens to my heart rate. And then, of course, a nice, easy cool down. So this is good for build phases, as I said. It tests how your heart rate responds to intensity and then bounces back. So in this tempo section right here, it's a good indicator of how aerobically fit you are and how, how well you recovered from those higher intensities and how your muscles did and how much glycogen you used up and fatigue you built up in these 4 by 800s So moving forward, and as a conclusion, work on intense, uh, I'm going to be working on intensities so that I can hold higher power at the same heart rate. So if I'm going to go back to that fast finish later on in a couple weeks, I want to make sure that I'm able to hold instead of 275 watts at 155 beats per minute, I want to see if I can hold 285 or 290 watts at 155 heart rate. So that's what I'm going to be looking for going forward in the build phase. And then also working on getting faster on the fast finish with the lower heart rate. So I'm going to be looking at that last two, three mile tempo bit at the end of my long runs to see if my how my heart rate adjusts and making sure that I'm hydrated enough so that I can nail those last three miles, as well as seeing how muscular fatigue my muscles are after doing that 13 mile plus zone two test. So overall conclusions, your running power versus your pace is a good way to measure aerobic fitness and base, training fit, uh, tr uh, base phase of training. It's a good indicator of when to move on to a different stimulus. Monitor aerobic fitness in other stages of your training and then also test for race day plans for power, pace, and heart rate. And what I mean there is if you have a plan of holding 280 watts for your looking at it for your event. So if you look at your power curve and say, you know, I should be able to hold 280 watts and you want to see what your power is doing and whether you're aerobically fit enough to hold those 280 watts, then you can do a test like this to say, all right, what's happened to my heart rate when I'm holding this amount of power? And then of course, the big one here is monitor hydration and fuel to make sure that you are um, fueling and hydrating correctly over the course of your runs. So that's it for today. Um, here are my citations. These are some great resources that you can check out. In particular, I really like the Triathletes Training Bible. The new fourth edition is superb. Uh, he really updated and did a lot of good updates to it. And then also another one of my favorites is Triathlon Science. Uh, a little outdate right now. It's 2013. It's hard to say, you know, it's outdated. Uh, but I do like that as a good, solid uh, book. It's, in essence, a bunch of chapters focusing on different parts of science within triathlon training. Anyway, if you have any questions or comments, head over to my website at braveheartcanada.com and let me know if you have any questions or comments. Love to hear your feedback. Thank you very much.